not only because of these conglomerates have begun to publish alternative comics, but also because in North America, independence of ownership does not guarantee cultural, artistic, or intellectual independence. Bongo, for example, though it's independently owned by Matt Grady, depends on licenses and essentially exists to promote The Simpsons in another medium. In this, it has much in common with the Dark Horse Comics, Boom Studios, Dynamite, IBW, and other small to mid-sized publishers that have prospered by licensing lucrative properties um, from other media, commissioning work by writers from film and television as well as comics, and appealing particularly to comic book stores as well as the book trade. All of these publishers, whether independent like Bongo or owned by a larger corporation like IDW, uh, are avid licensees of existing properties, such as popular television shows. They rely on said properties to underwrite everything else that they do. Dark Horse Comics was the forerunner of this trend. Yeah, its success with licensed properties from the late 1980s onwards is uh, almost certainly what enabled its survival. The upsurge in this kind of publishing since 2000 uh, testifies to, uh, as, as Bart Beatty has put it, the increasing integration of comics into the economies of other cultural industries. This is a trend that threatens to dissolve the very concept of a distinct comic book market. Recent independent publishers of this kind uh, have succeeded in developing direct market followings, in some cases by publishing stars uh, who became known for working for other larger companies first or in other media. However, uh, most of the output of these publishers is conventional, if not retrograde in style, and it exploits the very specialized or hothouse greenhouse conditions. Um, most of these are greenhouse. Yeah. Right. You understand the concept, right? A hot house uh, where things basically sweat and grow on their own terms. These, these publishers. <laughs> these publishers um, basically exploit the passions of devoted pop culture fans, of active fans. Um, comic books and graphic novels like these may be independent in name, uh, but they're really not oppositional in nature. I mean, their status vis a vis comic book culture is hardly opposition. The truly alternative periodical floppy, by contrast, is languishing. Indeed, in Roth's words, is virtually non-existent as a commercial niche. That was what Avon Tony was sailing into, in essence, that almost non-existent or vestigial niche when he created Optic Nerve 12. In different ways, Optic Nerve 12, which is a kind of unexpected anomaly, and the square-bound annual Love and Rockets both testify to uh, the decline of the traditional product of form. There are notable exceptions to this trend. Published by such companies as Picture Box, Koyama Press, Ad House, even Fantasy Graphics, as well as a slate of new comic books published um, by a project called Retrofit, recently launched by the artist Box Brown. Retrofit is a good example. Retrofit is frankly swimming against the tides of change aiming to, and I quote, highlight the importance of the floppy comic to retailers, fans, and the comics industry, end quote. Notably, the publisher, Box Brown, likens these floppies, despite their professional sheen, to the highly personal work found in handmade, self-published, often photocopied, mini-comics, which as some of you will know is a largely non-commercial amateur genre. Indeed, a shop owner in Los Angeles devoted to promoting comics like these told me that he refers to these comic books as minis, despite their standard size and professional status. In essence, these comic books, these floppies, complete an appropriation begun by Arkham in the late 60s. They seek to wrest a commercial format from its purely industrial origins. Um, yet they have either abandoned or they have avoided from the start long, complex, serialized narratives. So that in effect, each issue is a standalone art object. In short, the alternative comic book has been decoupled from serialization. Now, food belongs to this same, here's that word again, quixotic fringe, that the alternative floppies I've just mentioned uh, belong to. 
It shares their resistance to the dominant graphic novel aesthetic that now dominates comic discourse. I submit as evidence of the dominance of the graphic novel aesthetic um, many of the papers I've heard over the last few days. Hood and these other small objects seek to resist the graphic novel as the sole standard for excellence in comics. And it would be nice to claim that Hood or Reprofit or Smoke Signals, all of these, that they uh, foretell the resurgence of the comic paper or comic magazine as an economically viable form, but that is highly unlikely. Right? Rather, these projects are highbrow efforts to produce affordable art objects. Essentially, the comic book as a miniature artist's book. They allude to, but they are really very different from the ephemeral, affordable comic books of yore. Um, comics like these, and I would also include the deluxe pamphlets uh, published in series from publishers like Fanographics or the British company's No Brow uh, or Blank Slate, they all seem to have been inspired, I I'd say, by L'Association's small size formats, the Pat de Mouche and Nimonet formats, for example, which, as Mark Bailey observes, are, uh, and I quote here, the quintessence of cool, deluxe versions of something that ought to be almost totally disposable, end quote. Hood, being a newsprint paper, is less slick and durable than most of these others, but on the other hand, its broadsheet dimensions make it lavish in a different way. Now, whether the format seems cheap or not, clearly none of these publications are meant to be disposable. Uh, and if I may invoke Ian Haig's paper from Thursday, the goal here is, is to produce objects worthy of careful presentation and handling and preservation. In North America, all such publications depend on survival on their ability to be seen outside traditional comic book shops. In sum, Independent comics in the United States and Canada have undergone a threefold shift. One, genuinely alternative comics, of the kind that were once pioneered by the uh, direct market comic books, have migrated into multiple channels, including book publication, of course, but also web comics and small presses outside the orbit of the direct market, assisted by online consignment and convention sales. The synergy among all these factors can be very clearly demonstrated uh, by the rapturous reception of the webcomics artist Kate Beaton. Uh, some of you will remember that Jessica showed us a sample of her work yesterday. She received this rhapsodic reception uh, at recent shows, including the Alternative Press Expo and Small Press Expo in the States, where she was promoting her new book collection published by Ron Corden. Meanwhile, this is the second thing. The small, those small to mid-sized publishers that have recently blossomed in the direct market or comic book stores depend greatly on licensing and transmedia franchises. Think, for example, what Dark Horse Comics has done with Buffy the Vampire Slayer and its various uh, spin-offs, permutations. Uh, many of these companies are independent in the sense of being owned by an individual or small group rather than a corporation, um, and in the sense of all of sometimes offering the creators an alternative to traditional work-for-hire contracts. However, uh, in the larger cultural sense, I think we'd have to say, I would say, that they are dependent. That is, they are heteronymous rather than autonomous. And they certainly represent a trend that is apart from the dissident publishing traditions of underground and alternative.